Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Insider, brought to you just for a change by Vanishing Inc. My guest today is responsible for getting more people into card magic than probably anybody else with his amazing Card College series. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the one and only Roberto Giobi. Roberto, how are you this afternoon? Fine, thank you. How are you? I am delightful. It's a short show. There is no time for pleasantries. What's your magic origin story? You have 49 seconds. Yes. As a 14-year-old, I went to the public library and pulled out a book that had a hand with four different colored billiard balls. That's the mm-hmm. Colta original billiard ball with four different colored uh, balls. And that opened the window to my future. Much later. Perfect. There you are. Perfect. Let's go back to the start, that you're there in Basel, lovely cushy job with Autodesk, just when CAD was really in its infancy, and you quit all of that to do magic. Talk us through that time in your life and why you made that decision. Yeah, well, I I, uh, studied literature and, um, and linguistics at the beginning at the University of Basel until I, I realized that, uh, well, because I wanted to become a teacher. Uh, and then um, when we were at the beginning of the fifth semester, I think, we had to pick again the courses, you know, different courses, like lectures. And one was the, the origin of village names in southeast England before Shakespeare. I re- remember that, and that was Professor Stamm. And at that very moment, I said, this is so remote from life, I think I don't want to do that. And that's when I changed to the translators and interpreter school, and I finished that in 1984. So I was out of a job for, for, I think, for two months until um, uh, a friend, a magic friend called, uh, who who had, uh, I didn't know that at at that point, but he had uh, founded a software company. And he asked me, Roberto, what are you up to? And I said, well, uh, I finished my study. So I said, um, can you do translations from, for, uh, you know, for a softwares and things? So they, I never done that. So I go, okay, you're, you're, you're our man. When can you start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I got a, a, a very high salary at that time because of course they were selling, that was Autodesk, by the way, at, the, at that time, the inventors of CAD CAM, computer aided mm. design. <laughs> And they are, they were making something like in, I don't know in dollars close to ten thousand dollars for selling uh, seven or eight floppy disks and a manual, so you can imagine uh, they're making a lot of money. Anyway, so I did that for two years, and after two years, I went to my boss and I said, "Well, I I think I have to to stop this work because um, magic is you know is important to me." And so, so they said, "No, no, stay a little longer." You just have you just work four days, you know, eighty percent at the same salary, of course, <laughs> and, uh, and so I say okay, and so I stayed another two years. By nineteen eighty eight, uh, I won a prize at the FISM at the Hague, and there was no internet then uh, yet. Uh, in theory, I think there was, but in practice, nobody ha- had heard of it. And so I, I came, I went into uh, the radio and the press and and, the, and Saturday evening TV show uh, where a lot more people were watching it, you know, mm. uh, as as after internet or everything was. So uh, that uh, made my decision. I got a lot of uh, work. And it was, I have to say, not only due to that, it was just uh, a peak in the economy, you know, you're talking 1988, a, 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 a long time before the, the first crisis has started. Uh, yeah, and that's when I when I went to my boss and he looked at me and said, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back anytime, he said. You can come back. Now, that was good because, uh, yeah. you know, I, I had saved a little money uh, and the, the things are, you know, jobs were go, going well with magic. And I said, well, if, if it doesn't work, uh, I, I'd be able to come back. So I had this self-confidence, which is also not unimportant, you know. Uh, and I had also this, let's say, academic background, which is, uh, or was, and I think it still is, um, an advantage. If you negotiate with, uh, with a customer and he knows you finished your studies and you have a degree, you know, you're not just the guy who's doing magic. He doesn't know what to do, what else to do. But you say, oh, this 
this guy has uh, made a choice for some reason. And then, of course, you get a little bit older through the studies as well. You start to, to talk uh, um, better and more convincing. And, and that's, that was all part of, the, uh, of the, this first step into the professional life. And also, I must say, and that's, that's a lucky thing, let's say I had a, a 10 minute act or an eight minute manipulation act. Well, that's something that the market, at least at that time, did not really need a lot. A little, yes. But now it's a little bit more because we have more um, theatres again. We have small theatres, larger theatres, uh, and things like that. But at that time, it was not. And so uh, the magic I liked doing, like close-up magic and parlour magic, uh, talking, you know, with interaction, mm. exactly what the market uh, needed. So I never had to look you know, uh, what the market needs, and I did that, I just sold what I did, you know, like Picasso, uh, uh, who, who once said that the, the craftsman does what he can sell, the artist sells what he does. So I had the privilege of, uh, of uh, living like, like an artist from the, from the very beginning. And of course, and that was it's also a, um, a coincidence, if I had studied medicine or biology or, or IT or whatever, you know, uh, it would not have been as helpful as studying languages. Because through that, I happened to speak six languages. Now in Switzerland, it was a tiny country at that time, we were like six and a half million, now we got about eight million, but still it's very, you know, I think it's smaller than Los Angeles. Mm. <laughs> and, and so we, we have a lot of convention, international conventions. Uh, and of course, I was able to. Uh, and these are at that time, and they're still mostly men. You know, so in an evening, a social evening after a, a, a dinner or so, they they wouldn't be able to hire comedians or or other people who would just use one language. They would have to to to, uh, to hire some some visual act, but preferably a, a visual act, which magic is, plus also a communicative act because. One speaks to, to the eye and the emotion, the other one to the intellect. And if you can, if you can balance and combine that, you, you have a big vantage point. And that was the reason why, uh, yeah, it was very easy for me to, to get into this business. A book writing at that time, uh, you know, it started in 1985, was just a hobby. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, you, now in the I, pandemic, in the pand you know, it's two, two, two years in the pandemic. We, we are talking now in February 2022, where there are practically no jobs. Now, yeah. after thir 30 years, yeah, after thir over 30 years of being an author, uh, I, I can now make uh, a so so living by my publications alone. And I yeah. think in magic, there are very, very few um, authors, or at least authors of books. Who, who can do that? You know, it, it, Absolutely. It's a lot, but it's just to keep you above water without the shows. But yeah, yeah. There you are. Yeah. You were obviously back then with the Autodesk gig working at the very cutting edge of technology. How do you feel today that technology, about the impact that technology has on magic with regards to small electronic devices, magic apps? What's your opinion on, on that? Yeah, I think that it's it's always been developed in relationship to each other, you know, and and magic is speaking to something which does change but will never go away, and that it's the imaginary of the human, his, he, he, the, the capacity of of the human being to create realities in his or her head, you know, uh, so. Of course, the way this happens has changed, definitely. You can see this from book uh, writing to, to show performances to TV. Everything, of course, has changed. But the basic element has remained. And uh, the more evolved technology gets, uh, I will, and I'm not the first to say that, the more there is a need for compensation for that. You know, there has to be a balance. You, uh, every person in different degrees, though, needs to have the, this balance between the, the, the imaginary and the rational. Uh, now, uh, maybe you wanted to, to also to imply uh, about the, the methods, you know, we, we are using. Well, definitely 
the fact that uh, these little devices, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, just a smartphone, yeah, mm. does some incredible things and allows um, sort of uh, uh, supernatural effects to take mm. place. Well, uh, at the beginning, you could use these methods, especially mental magicians, uh, you know, men mentalism and mental magic was using that. But nowadays, as soon as you take an unusual pad or thing like that, or you're doing some kind of telepathy or so, uh, you have to uh, make your presentations such that the spectators will eliminate these possible explanations. You know, so mm -hmm. we are reverting back to the non-technological methods, really. You know, yeah. Although, already in the sixties, I, I remember, or, or fifties, or e even earlier, when they were doing that uh, two-person telepathy act. You know, second sight, mm -hmm. called the second vue, the deuxième vue, uh, older than Robert Houdin, but certainly Robert Houdin and his son made it. Uh, I think they might have been responsible for making it popular among magicians then you can follow that in the literature you get all these uh, uh codes you have little chapters on on codes how to communicate things uh, although it's funny that uh, in 40 in the 1490s they, there is was an author called luca pacioli uh, he wrote the viribus quantitatis and he mentioned uh, giovanni de jasone who was the first to do a car i mean the, I think one of the first documented card tricks. And there it says, uh, just the effect, he says, uh, you have a card selected, and then uh, um, by words, signs, and postures of your body, you communicate to a boy who will then divine the card. So, okay, so at that, at that point, of course, the, you did not to use a disclaimer. But I think as soon as um radio technology came into common knowledge from that point all the acts in the 50s the first thing they had to do was to say uh have a volunteer come up and say would you please look that my medium is not connected to any uh, radio device or so that's a similar problem to to when yeah. you do card magic you know when you do card magic you, do, you can do the simplest trick the first explanation is oh you have marked cards Right. So, I mean, although it's not a good thing to say, I have a deck of completely normal cards. You, know, <coughs> you nonetheless have to acknowledge that the solution, the first solution the audience might come up with is that you have more cards. So you have to yeah. find a smart way to uh, to eliminate that without saying it. I speak about this in my in my book, Sharing Secrets. Um, and and that is so. For instance, an, uh, a method to do this is just to use a, a new deck, and, and have a little uh, pocket knife and open it up while you do some introductory uh, text, and then take it out. You know, and maybe even have a receipt and say, "Oh, that's where I bought the deck. It's a new deck." You know, and that these are the cards that are being used by casinos. So, so you know, so implicitly you say, "I have here a normal deck," without saying it. Without saying it, yeah. It's modern technology. Now you see, uh, I, I come back. Uh, I go off tangents because <laughs> our art is not only complex, you know, it's all already incredibly deep. Absolutely. But it's all networking, you know. Of course, of course. Okay, so I, I hope I have given a, an exhaustive answer to your question. Perfect answer. Along with writing and teaching and performing magic, you also give talks and workshops for businesses on topics like creativity and communication. It seems like there's a huge overlap with magic there. Can can you teach someone to be creative? I mean, you. I think what you you can. Do, I mean, this has been a, a dream of humanity to be able to transfer characteristics from a person who has this particular skill. To someone else. Mm. I mean, if you if you look, and that's not just since self help books started in the forties or the fifties of the last century. I mean, it's always been a dream to transfer that. So that's that's something we are always looking for. Now, there are um, what you're coming up are of course models, and as someone 
once we marked because all models are wrong but some are more useful and so talking about creativity there are techniques and strategies to help your lazy brain which which you know we are all to begin with lazy different degrees of course and there are so many factors that make us come out of this laziness so that has to do with what we call motivation you know mm. so um, that that's another business a lot of money is may, being made i'm not making that uh, but uh, yeah i think if people can become aware oh um, I want to be more creative, whatever that means. First of all, let's, let's leave that. To my way. Uh, they are making a first step, you know, at saying, well, let, let me buy a toolbox. You know, you, you have problems in your house. Well, the first thing you need to buy is a toolbox. So you, you have a screwdriver and a hammer and you can already fix 40% of your problems at home. And then you need a little bit more, you know, and if you have a, uh, glasses or a watch, then you need some very, very special sets of, of tools. And that's what you can teach, of course. And then it will it will depend greatly. It will depend greatly. It's even more than the, than the talent and the willingness and everything, which is also important. If the person has a specific uh, topic or problem to apply these strategies to. Now, we in magic are very fortunate that we do have magic. We have our we have the effects, we have the presentations, we have the methods, we have all the uh, psychological shenanigans we need to have to to make the people can't find out how we are doing it. So in, we we do have a specific problem, which is let's say normally call it a, a trick in, in, in our jargon. Uh, we use other terms for for lay language, of course, but we have a trick, and if you then on top of a of, of a good a good trick or starting point you know have some knowledge about how um, to find information how to juggle information how to um, identify problems that's 50 percent of the solution right mm. when, when you begin in magic we don't identify problems you begin as a beginner in magic i was you take a trick and say oh, it's wonderful and now that I'm I'm giving coaching lessons, you know, I have even advanced people, even professionals, coming and doing a trick, and I immediately say that. Well, I don't say it that way, you know. I don't say that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. But I see. I say, well, let me ask you a question. Uh, why do you do that? Or how about doing it this way? Or um, what alter? What made you come up with that idea? You know, and suddenly they realize, gee, that's a problem. Why do why do I put the the, the the aces in a row? Why don't I put them in a square? Or why don't I not put them in a diamond force? Or why don't I you know something else? Yeah. But just s seemingly trivial things become be, become uh, not uh, uh, require now your creativity. Now creativity, I must say, is often mistaken for being an inventor. Okay. So, oh, he's creative. He just came up with a trick. Now, this is, this is of course, also true. This is the, the first degree of creation. I, I, I wrote a lengthy essay on that, I think, in one of my genie columns. And it's back in, in Sharing Secrets also as well, one of the theories. You know, uh, there are different levels uh, where you can become creative. You, c you can't invent a new, a new uh, phenomenon. You know, it's, it's a appearing, disappearance, uh, transformation it's about a dozen phenomena there is a taxonomy various uh, works have tried not many have tried to create a taxonomy including myself so you find uh, the phenomena is not there are not many so you can't invent anything there the, the instruments with which the, the phenomena is interpreted also there very little things that came you know we are still using coins and ropes and, and, and cups and balls and all these things occasionally use a uh, a CD instead of using coin, you know, something. A few new, I think, that's not a lot. Then you have the themes, you know, the themes which are, which are within each instrument. It's, 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 it's a lecture, I won't give it here. But what I want to say, that the more you come up on this, uh, on this sort of, uh, whatever it is, a, a pyramid or concentric circle, the easier it is to find variations. 
Right. You know, when you come to most of the things are handling variations or there is a new presentation to it. But basically you say, oh, did you invent cards? Did you invent the four aces? Did you invent the fact that they assemble? No. So, uh, so creativeness is often interpretative in creativeness. That is the ability to, to take uh, a piece and to uh, be able to, to inf through the study, through the uh, diligent study of it, be able to infuse sometimes only small things, sometimes a little bit of a bigger thing, and to make it the expression of yourself. Because whatever a piece of art is, it's all, always related to, to the inner world of, of, the, of the artist. It's always an expression, an expression through his or her hands and through the instrument, right? Mm. Otherwise, it's, you can't just go like this and then in art, you know, but you have to, to paint or you have to write or you have to do, to perform a magic piece. So that this creativity thing is a really a big subject that can be we look at from so many different uh, points. And you were referring to the lay people. Yeah, I, I do this occasionally. I, 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 I never. I'm, I'm a terrible marketer. You know, if you, this is an, it is a prof as you know, probably if, if you are in this bit line of business, it's a profession of your own. You need your own agents. You need to to get into that. So I, I've done quite a bit in the past. Uh, well, twenty twenty five years, but. Uh, but not, I, I never made it a profession as little as I made trade shows a profession or, you know, sure. I, I did some trade shows, but I'm happy I, I don't just do that. And I'm also happy I'm just not doing just talks. I'm very yeah. happy with the fact of having done um, almost everything you can do in magic except cruises and, and circus. <laughs> I, I even did children's show at the beginning, you know. Or in shopping malls, and I've done it all in nightclubs and at the beginning Monte Carlo and all this stuff. But uh, so uh, yeah, that that's for me. You know, for me, this is the good thing. And and now I'm shifting more because well, also because of Corona, of course, uh, very little shows, almost none shows, more to the to to the writing, you know, and and, and the, the the creation of the, which which keeps me busy. Sure, sure. I read. In an interview, whilst I was researching this, that you thought that young magicians should needed to learn the difference between investing their money and spending their money with regard to magic. Can you expand on that? Well, this is one of the, the secrets of life, you know, to know when something, when you spend money, it's away. It doesn't come back. When you invest money, it, it has returns. Of course, these are metaphorical expressions, and mm. you know that some investments <laughs> go down the drain as well. You know, bad investments. You don't know. You don't know before that. But uh, you know, buying a book, for instance, that has been recommended to try, this considered a classic, or so, is normally more rewarding than buying a single trick or uh, a bunch of these collector cards. You know, they're now there's a crazy. The youngster go into a magic shop and spend, let's say, uh, their pocket money, they have uh, $50 or, or, or whatever it is uh, on, on five decks of different decks of cards instead of going out and, and taking with them a, a book or a, or a really good DVD, of which there are not so many. But uh, uh, or both, ideally, you know. Because I'm not saying that DVD is better than the book. Sure, uh, it's just a different way of transferring information, and a different way of uh, using this information in your mind to recreate something personal. Mm. Uh, that's what it is about, you know. So uh, yeah, so uh, I, I had I don't know if it was well. I guess it was intuitive. I, I had very little money, you know, because. My father died when I was age fourteen, and my my mother was a was an invalid, and we just had a small um, money, and I was working whenever I could, besides school and and studies. But I I spent almost everything in uh, well going to conve even going to conventions at that time was a great thing, you know, because now you have chat rooms and you have uh, internet things and all that. But at that time, going to your club 
reading a book, getting a magazine. Don't even talk about videos. Videos just came in the, I think, in the, the mid eighties. Yeah. Right? I started in seventy three, so the first ten years, nothing like that. So I spend the money on that, uh, and if I look at my books, you know, or or at the at the few products I have or video, and I I read the comments. I try to read a little, but occasionally, and and I say this is good, but it's too expensive or something like that. I just you know it. I just said, this person has no idea what he's talking about. Because if I just look what is in Card College, you know, the tens of thousands of, uh, let's talk in dollars, just in Swiss francs here, we were, I have invested, you know, if I made the bookkeeping, I never done that, and I don't want to do that, but just to answer this question, and I made a bookkeeper, I say, oh, I spent $700 to go to Madrid to see Juan Tamariz. I spent uh, $80 an hour to get lessons from a radio speaker on how, how to, to build my voice. I spent that much for, for these books. I spent uh, $500 to get to Paris to meet Bernard Belize. And in Volume 3, there is a, a, a packet switch, or Volume 4, I think, there's a packet switch by Bernard Belize. He showed me then. You know, if you do all that, you say, I think that was an investment. And, and it was not just, to get me right, not just for material exchange. It was that all this became a part of my life. And, you know, in life, you need, in order to, to, to grow, not, not only like that, but, but also uh, as a person, you need a vehicle. You have to travel through life with something. The best thing is... A passion, something you are passionate about, and that's my big, big privilege and that of many who are watching us to have magic as that. And I made the investment in myself and magic, and through that, I became the person I am today. Uh, you know, so that's what I mean by by investment. Yeah, you know? thank you, that, thank you. Uh, Talking of Card College, what's the story behind it being created? The, the, and was the plan just for one initially, or did you always have? I'd call it. Oh, that's yeah, a long story. Uh, I I've answered that in in many parts, but um, it's. I think many things came together. You know, many things. Think one was um, at at age twenty or so, uh, even before. I was one of the first here to do, you know, in Switzerland to do really difficult sleight of hand and through my language knowledge I had access to the to the French to the Italian the German to the English literature so it was great uh, and so soon they started to, to ask me oh could you do a little lecture or something like that so I you know explain a few tricks not mine but the ones I had read and interpreted and they go oh but how do you do this how do you do this and yeah and this and the, and the double lift and this false shuffle and I said, well, you got to go to read, uh, at that time it was Roy Road, you know, for sure. Roy Road to Card Magic, the, the only didactical work um, to speak of until the, yeah, the 1990s when Card College came about. And and so that, that, that might have been the, oh, could you not write something about this? You know, as a, a 20 years ago. But, you know was something in there and then I, I've always been very passionate about making notes you know in all my travels I always buy my notebooks I even have notebooks everywhere you know you know small ones here I, I they, they just the small ones I can, can put in my in my pocket you know and things and I write things in uh, but then I you know and, and so each time I came back from from meeting Tamaris or Ascani or anyone else I had like 20 pages or something and after 10 years you know I had like I don't know, 50 notebooks already with thousands of pages. And I said, geez, well, how am I going to, I'm going to forget all that. But of course, let's say if you have a thousand things, a way to, 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 to um, get an overview is either you throw things away or you arrange them into order. Best thing is you do two things. You know, you create a uh, hundred drawers, you put the important stuff in there according to a certain system, to a taxonomy, to an order system, you use a terminology, you give it names, and you throw the rest out. And that was basically what I've done with the cut. I said, oh, uh, how could I organize that stuff? And I said, well, 
why don't I organize it according to the needs of a, of a beginner? Let's say somebody says, oh, I, I've fallen in love with, uh, with, with card magic. Now I need to, to learn how, how to live with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how to, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's an uh, analogy to life, really, also. Uh, and, and so that, that's how I started to, so it was a big, I think I have this in uh, Secret Agenda, yes, yeah, Secret Agenda. I have the mind map, a big mind map. You know, each time I said, what's the first thing that they need to learn? Uh, what, what's, what's a good technique for it? And what's a good trick, a trick that shows it? That I got from Roy Road to Card Magic. This is the only thing that's got. Uh, have a chapter, controls. Think, what are the five best controls? Best meaning, what? Uh, looking them at, at tools, what are uh, the the five big problems in card control in different situations? And what 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 would then be the best tool? So that was the. But but also it was not a compilation because something oh it's an excellent compilation it saves you from searching the literature. Well, those who say that have not understood what card college is because I have never ever copied things or taken just the way it is you know it's written and just transferred it there. That would have been an, some kind of encyclopedia. I have recreated everything through the. The, the, the five sieves, I say, of of my experience uh, as a, as a as a professional performer, as someone who has who knows what it is to start out, as a historian or historically interested person, uh, uh, and uh, as someone who knows how to transfer information through the written medium, which is a profession of its own. I had to learn because. <laughs> I don't know if you can study that anywhere. So uh, yeah, so that that's that's a few flashes, you know. From and then it, it just came out in German, obviously, just for the as I said at the beginning. I said that for those people who said, well, here you have now volume one and two. Actually, at the end of volume one and two, I wrote, I will never again write a book like that. Something I think it's somewhere there. And of course, two years later, I wrote three and four, and like six or seven years later, because I had sort of a burnout. I, I wrote five, and in between I wrote the light books. The, well, the light books is funny because it's like a, a runner in a in a marathon. And I, I'm using this as an analogy because I, I I don't do marathons, but but the analogy is good. You know that if you done forty kilometers, when you arrive, you cannot stop. Mm -hmm. You have to run a little bit more because otherwise you're going to collapse. Same thing. You you write something like uh, Card College, Volume One and Two, which took one or two years. They, I couldn't stop. I just well, I, I wrote another little book, which was the first light book, the second light book, the first I had written before. Yeah. Well, that's a funny story. And then came the French translation was the first. Uh, it was Richard Falmer from Strasbourg, a very good friend and um, a great specialist of. Uh, self-working and faro tricks actually some of his contributions are in my books very proud of that and jean pierre honecker he, he was that at that time the publisher they published it first and then came the spanish one with translated by rafael benatar and then only then came the english and i know stephen Minch at that time with hermetic press was very hesitant i can't even remember how we got together you know uh, but he didn't really believe in, in the success of the books because uh, uh, he said, oh, well, there are so many, you know, there is already uh, th that book and there is this book and there are uh, about uh, starting out in card magic. But he still did it. Uh, and then, well, <laughs> <laughs> his best-selling book ever. Uh, and now still, if you, if you go to any dealer, you know, you can go to the remotest dealer in Alaska and you ask him, what's your best-selling book? He'd probably tell you Card College 1 and 2. Almost certainly. Put, you know, 1 and 2 together. I could, yeah, so yeah. This is the German edition here. This is my. This is now the 7th or 8th edition I have, which is a lot in German, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I, I sell them together. People are not allowed to buy one. This is something the Americans started. Because said, oh, it has to be. It has not to be too expensive. You know, you're coming back to the investment. So, oh, you know, I, I, I mean, I must laugh at people. Who say, well, uh, it, it's thirty nine dollars, but Royal Road is only eighteen dollars. Uh, I buy Royal Road. Jeez, what's the difference? 
it's it's what's that twenty dollars different difference and and you're going with with an inferior car you know you buy inferior shoes or something like that uh, well it that that's that's a, anyway so uh <laughs> i hope this answers your it does a little bit it does it does Other you, things, you, i forget you mentioned you mentioned um notes and taking notes there what's your strategy for note taking yeah take take a piece of paper and write on it that's that's <laughs> my basic strategy really and uh i mean i i've written i have um i have a, a a blog which goes online every sunday morning at 007 so where should people go if they want to find that blog roberto jobby all in one word dot com so it's roberto jobby dot com and and then go to news okay. or there's even a function which says all newsletters because now it's, it's i'm in, in my second or my third year actually and there i have written in different ones um about note taking it's really it's really a, a big thing i mean uh, uh taking notes you know but the, at, at first you just take notes in, in a in a notebook or in an electronic i have even a, i have a talk on that you know i have a three-part talk uh, i just gave the second part now in in torino after two years break because of, of the pandemic <laughs> and um and that was how to take notes with Evernote, for instance. I mean, any, any app, uh, any electronic note-taking app. Of course, that has greatly um, enhanced the way notes can be taken because you can now pull in PDFs, you know, or extracts. Of, that's, that's even more important. If you have a PDF of 250 pages, you only want to have two pages. So you have to be able to have a, an app that extracts it. Now you can put it in your note. You can yeah. extract, put a film clip in it. You can yeah. put a, a web clip. You go to the, to the internet and clip a piece of information into it. You can have a voice message, which I, which I send. You know, I, I have a, oh. I have a, this is a, this is a good one here. It's called for, for memo. It's uh, it has a big oh, I don't know, thing. So you, you just you can't miss that if you have that in your car, you know, normally. Because if you have the small ones, uh, it's very dangerous. You shouldn't do that in the car. But this one is a big one here. You just go like this and you go, rah, 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 boom. And you got it there and you can send it to your notebook. Or when, I, when I'm going for a walk, you know, I, I don't do jogging, but uh, I do walks. Here, here where I live, I have nice vineyards. Uh, and uh, and woods and they could go and walk. So when I have an idea, I go like this. So you can add this. This is and of course you can uh, you can tag the notes. So you can. That's the most important thing, of course, is um, be able to search for for your information after that. But you can that, do this with paper uh, as well. You know, a, a good strategy is to use a notebook that has removable pages. So when you take, so you know, at, at some point you're creating a taxonomy. You're going to make notes on controls, on forces, and you can take Card College for that. You know, car, the chapters in Card College are really a basic taxonomy of mm. the, of the major technical subjects. You have esti so whenever you have an idea on estimation, you can have you know you have this uh, in a binder where you have some uh, how you call this uh, you have yeah I think you call them tags leaves. Or it doesn't matter yeah, yeah we know what you mean you have pages that separate the, the the topics yeah yeah i think you call them tags or writers or whatever you know we know what you mean I don't know. so so you open up your control and once you have controls you know of course i have a sub taxonomy with controls you go with the jog with the break with the step mathematical controls a side seat the pass etc math etc you know you have like a dozen at least different mm. types of controls and each time you have an idea or you hear something or you see it in a, in a video that that's important uh, that that's that's the only one to uh, to make a, a video of useful you have to hit the, the the pause button whenever an idea comes up. You know, like like if you're watching this uh, this interview, there's going to be a lot of practical ideas. Although we are talking about magic and life in general, you know, then hit the, the pause button. Go to the notebook. Uh, is that a theory? Okay, then then you start to put theory in it. You know, uh, and, and ma make a tag. Leave a border. Leave a border on the right. That's another. That's Cornell University. I think if you go to the internet and you. 
I think it's, I hope I don't mix it up. Cornell University have a, a, a wide border on the right where you, when you have a note, you have, you have a note taking, you know, you make a note, pass, you know, a note, double lift, mm-hmm. you know. So afterwards, if you, on a page, you usually have like five or six bullet points like that. You can immediately locate them. Sure, sure. And you put them. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a full class, you know, how to, how to do that. It's just a few ideas. Well, thank you for the ideas. Um, what excites you about magic today? <laughs> this, this is a, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good question to, to write about or, uh, but it is like love, you know, you, you don't care. You're just happy that, that it happens with you. <laughs> You know, just happy that it happens with you. I mean, certainly. Uh, so I, I'm a I'm a person. I'm very hedonistic. So I do the things that I like doing, and I avoid the things that I don't like doing as much. Then, uh, and this has changed, of course. Hmm. This has, this has changed, of course. So p- performing is is no longer so so incredibly important for me. I mean, of, of course, magic is a performing art. There's no doubt about that. And you can only test everything you come up with intellectually in the real performance. So that's, that's true. Uh, but I might get more excited nowadays about uh, finding new twists and ideas in, uh, in already existing things of mine. So it goes through my routine. Uh, I'm just on a project now where I'm putting uh, the, the tricks of card college three and four on, on a video, you know. Huh. And, uh, of course, this forces me to uh, re redo these tricks. Some of them I've always been doing, but some I, I, I did at a certain period and I haven't. And, and so I'm trying to come up with uh, uh, more meaningful presentations, you know. More uh, instead of just saying, "Oh, okay, let me show you something with the four aces." I'm going to put the four aces here. You know, find something that is a better emotional hook mm-hmm. uh, that is a little bit more interesting than just uh, showing. So these things, of course, uh, history and biographies excite me. Of course, seeing these young people do some these are incredible things and seeing how. Uh, how innovation takes place a lot on on a technical level above all, you know, because you don't get new types of slides. It's, it's, it's no. still a, a palm and the switch uh, and etc. But the way they're doing it, you know, there's, this is, uh, and of course, this presentational um, innovations or mixes with different other uh, arts, that, that's uh, interesting. So, um, I find this. Otherwise, I've always been excited by just getting together with other uh, interesting uh, people who, who do magic and uh, and exchange ideas on a non-competitive level. You know, not just to get together to fool each other or to show off how clever you are, or how much you know, but uh, in a sincere interest to, to share information and to, uh, and to and to improve something you've done. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Improving something. This is this is in one. If I had to answer in one sentence, improving. So, in, no, no, improving, in the sense of not going out like many do nowadays and say, "Oh, I, I have invented a new trick." That's bullshit. You know, they probably. So, no, no. It's just do something. Yeah, I shouldn't say improve. I should say improve myself or do something I do better. That excites me. Yes. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Obviously, apart from your own, what are some card magic books that you think every card magician should read? Now, th- this is this is the famous question for for uh, favorite books, you know. And just in my recent blog, that's going to go online on uh, on on Sunday. I I speak about the the different lists you can make if a beginner. You know, uh, somebody says, "Oh, I, I love to do magic." I ask you, "What are 
the, 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 the best books, the favorite books. Well, that list would be a different one than if I said, if somebody asked me, well, in, in the history of magic, what do you think are the, did you ask for, for card books or for? Mm, cards, yeah. yeah. What are the card books that that have made a difference, you know, that, that, that have uh, dramatically changed, that have um, uh, shifted paradigms and so, that would be a different list, you know. Because okay, I, so let's not do beginners. Let's do people that are into card magic. Hofsinger and, and Robert mm -hmm. Rudin, which is fantastic card books, and, and also Ernest to a certain degree. I would never recommend to a beginner, you know, sure. to understand this bullshit, you know, uh, or a collector or something. So it's, uh, but I think if you, once you, well, you're asking me about, about card magic now. So that's the reason I wrote Card College, you know, because I thought. And that, that has nothing to do with, you know, overestimating myself or something or trying to sell something. That's not the point. But the reason I wrote a card college is that I said that's the books one could or should start because you get it identifies all the bases. It gives good examples, technical and theoretical and performance wise. And now you, you can reach black belt level with card college in cards but as you know this is also a metaphorical of course expression uh once you get the black belt that's when you start learning mm. you know because of the black belt is just the basics now you master the basic now you master the instrument and not vice versa because it's one of the different the beginner he's he's it's, it's the instrument that you know you can see that they they're, they're not the, it's not the same thing you know there yeah. is there is the mind, there is the hand, and there is the deck. And and with your black belt, the mind, the hand, and the deck is one. Mm -hmm. and that's when you start. Well, then of course I'm I'm of course it's old school. I'm I'm uh, sixty two. I'm going to be, become sixty three this year. So for my references, uh, would go back to expert card technique. Of course, this is one of my my very favorite books. You know, uh, Paulie Paul's. Card magic, that I still think is very the the books by Frank Garcia, you know that uh, then um, Encyclopedia of Card Tricks, uh, a bad book in a way, badly described, very superficial in a paragraph, because you got millions of of possibilities to become creative your own, you know. So that yeah. that's another book I would well, right. And of course. Um, uh, the Ascanian, the Tamaris book, being from the Spanish school of magic, of course, I'm uh, been greatly influenced by those, because those do not only tell you, or, or the the Gans and Vernon books, obviously, you know the Ga I mean, of course, the Gans and uh, Vernon books, great, but what the Spanish books, the Tamaris and Ascanio, and I hope mine also, in a, to some degree, do. Uh, they go beyond teaching just techniques and tricks and maybe even a clever presentation, but uh, fill the space between the lines with uh, questions and challenges and more often than not even give solutions to mm -hmm. psychology, communication, staging, uh, how, how to practice this thing, what to do if something goes wrong, all these things that even in the great books, you don't find greater magic, for instance. You you, you don't find uh, much of of of, of this um, uh, things. You know uh, this uh, non technical, non effect, non presentational ideas. Yeah, that was the way books were. I mean, it's still very good for for the material because you, you need sure. that. You know, in, in every profession, you have to have the foundation. There is no shortcut. Yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes it's. You think, oh yeah, you, you you can make if you you get into mysticism and things, and uh, and you make a wonderful presentations and tell wonderful stories, you know, and put some music to it. And say, no, no, it's it's first you must master the instrument and the basic techniques that go with it, and then you can do the other thing. There is a there's an order of things. Sure, we're almost out of time, but I would like to know um, what what are you working on now? What's what's next apart from Sunday's blog post that we've already, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, already mentioned? The blog is true. Yeah, that's that's uh, that keeps me busy. No, well, I'm uh, as I'm saying, I'm putting a volume three and four of Card College now on um, on video, as I did uh, 
like oh, I think it's 15 years ago, I did this thing with uh, with uh, Frankie Glass and uh, and Jim Steinmeier. This was the Card College One and Two, right? And then I did with Vanishing Ink another wonderful project, which is no longer available now as a uh, hardware, but you, you can still download it for Vanishing Ink. This masterclass, which is is a to totally different angle. It, this is merely technical. And now I'm going back to this one. I'm caught in three and four, so that would take but the next three months uh, of of work. I'm that, and of course I I do have a well. I, I just had two two tricks or products out of the prophecy and the red card mm. but uh yeah, but that's over that doesn't uh, that doesn't bother me anymore so uh I, i'm not someone who who is interested in coming up with tricks and, and selling tricks that, that was just a byproduct what i'm interested in is more to study specific topics and if they are sufficiently interesting to to share them with others through a book or a video that that's actually, uh, I I have not created any of my writings or video publication with the idea in mind that I wanted to sell something. It has been the. Let's take an example. This is by Vanishing Ink. Since we are, uh, this never heard of them. It's worth the thing. <laughs> I had been, you know, this this was my forty eighth lecture. I have now about fifty six different lectures I've given in the last past, and each time I picked the subject. And gave lectures. Okay, some of the lectures I only give once or twice. Some I've given for years. And that one I had given for years in many places, you know. And uh, uh, and and when we when I was booked to come to uh, Cheltenham at that time, mm. Andy, Andy and Josh did, did this uh, convention. They asked me to do again a special workshop the day before I think it was for about forty or fifty people, and to tape it, you know. And then this was so. This was something which came out after ten years. I had already done that. Yeah. Uh, okay. And the same thing is is with uh, the the other things. Uh, the secret, the, the agendas for it. We did hidden agenda together with Vanishing Ink, yeah. and uh, that was a sequel to to a secret agenda. And that was all, all the thousands of ideas that were left over. After I had written the art of switching decks, stand up, stand up card magic. It's another thing, you know. It was I say, okay, let me study a subject from A to Z almost. You know, not not just a bunch of good tricks and techniques to do stand up, but really, if you if you get a stand up card magic, be it the, the the DVD or the or the or the book, it's a real course in how to study a specific subject. But, so the book just came out years later after I had done many lectures about this subject. And, uh, yeah, or The Art of Switching Decks, that is just an example of how I uh, study a specific topic, you know. Because uh, Switching Decks is just like Chapter 44 in Volume 4 of Card College. But I could do a book like that for every uh, other chapter. Yeah. If I was a professor at a university, I, I would be paid for that, you know. Or if there was a no, really, I'm not, you would, of course, of course. Uh, we we need a foundation in magic. We need a foundation that has um, that has some money, you know, and people can make smart decisions. And you've got to ad identify those people who can do things which are important, and then you have to finance that. Yeah. And that's how it works yeah. in magic. Well, in all arts, yeah, everywhere it works except magic. Yeah, you know, except yeah. magic. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful lot. dream. Maybe one day we can make it happen when Josh and Andy retire with all their Vanishing Ink millions. They can set up the Vanishing Ink Foundation. Ah, well, before that, they are very young now. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto Giobbi, thank you so much for your time. We always end the show with four quick fire questions. Oh, are you ready? Oh, that very well, yeah. Okay, favourite pizza topping? Ah, uh, anchovy. Favorite movie. The Sting. Favorite person or people who make music. Music. Uh, um, I don't. I'm not much music. Um, I don't know. Uh, Edit Biaf. And finally. 
Who would you rather fight, one massive Andy or a hundred tiny Joshuas? <laughs> uh, I, I, I try to, to use Aikido and, 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 and avoid both of them. <laughs> Roberto, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, everyone who watched us. And uh, again, thank you, Damien, for for uh, well for this very likable talk. Thank you. Thank you. For so. asking smart questions. <laughs> thank you.